Okay, wir machen jetzt weiter. Ähm, mein Name ist Bente Scheller, ich leite das äh, Büro der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung in Beirut und ich werde jetzt äh, auf Englisch wechseln, um in direkter Kommunikation mit Lauren Wolf aufzustehen. Uh, welcome, Lauren Wolf. Uh, I'm so happy that you can be with us and I'm very happy about the turnout of the event altogether. It's really impressive to see so many interested people and uh, I think the morning's first uh, session already showed there is so much of an interest and there are so many interesting contributions that we're a bit uh, tight in terms of time. Therefore, I will keep my introduction now of Lauren Wolf very short. I think many of you already know her anyway. Uh, following her on Twitter or know her by the great project. She's the director of uh, Women Under Siege, uh, which does a great documentary work on everything related to, uh, to women in conflict in so many areas that I really find it a very valuable resource. Um, we were just uh, talking about that probably most of you do not yet know there is a hashtag for this conference. So if you want to tweet, please feel free to do so. The hashtag is no spring. Uh, please use it so we also can reach out to many others. Uh, Lauren Wolf is an award-winning journalist and she will now also uh, give us a great presentation. I encouraged her to keep it brief even though of course uh, she has a lot to share. So if I hassle her, please uh, don't be angry. It is all in your interest so you can have a bit of space for some questions afterwards. But altogether I'm afraid we have only about 45 minutes. So uh, we need to keep it all a bit tight. And then, of course, I mean, during the day, uh, she will still be with us. So there will be other chances uh, to exchange. I'm sure about that. So please, Lauren, start. Hi, everyone. Um, I think we're going to switch to a presentation up here whenever the human who does that. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so um, thank you all for coming. I'm actually, again, I'm pleased to see so many people here because I've been going around the world speaking about this topic. And usually there aren't so many men in the audience, so this is nice. Um, and usually there aren't so many people because I don't know how many people actually care. Um, so it's really great to see you all here. Um, and it's great that we have this conference. Um, just a little bit of background to begin. So I am the director of the Women Under Siege Project at the Women's Media Center which was founded by Gloria Steinem, Jane Fonda, and Robin Morgan in the US. R Gloria actually came up with the idea for doing a project about rape and war because she had read a book about the Holocaust and rape. And it was an untold history until this point. She realized if we had known more about that, could we have prevented what later happened in Rwanda or Bosnia or what other, whatever other war was upcoming. So what we're doing is a journalism project that documents as much as we can historically through the 20th century and contemporary stories on what's happening in war now. Excuse me, I don't know how that happened, but okay. This is a project that took off um, just a month or so after the main project launched. And it's actually a crowd map of how rape is used in Syria. And I'll explain what crowd map means. Um, it's using a software called Ushahidi, which is crowdsourcing. So anyone who wants to can come to this site and say, you know, a friend of mine experienced sexualized violence in this city at this time, and we think these people committed it. Um, as we've all heard about HarassMap, they use uh, this software extremely well. Uh, my project, unfortunately, has not worked in the way that theirs does. Um, I kind of didn't expect any women to come to the site and say, I was raped, you know, I'm a Syrian woman. Um, so certainly that hasn't happened. Uh, what has happened is we've had a handful of people who've heard second or third hand reports. So those go onto the map. But mainly what it's become is an aggregated site where I've Basically, uh, myself and my team, which consists of epidemiologists at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health, this is a, a joint project with them, um, a number of Syrian women who work as volunteers and translators and researchers, um, and myself, we go about calling every piece of information we can find, whether it's from NGOs like Human Rights Watch, IRC, Amnesty, media sources, you know, media reports, uh, the UN's reports, we pull every piece of information we can and we plot them on this map. In addition to that, I've done um, some extensive on the ground reporting myself. So it's really kind of an old school journalism project, you know, gumshoe reporting, but you doing it in this interesting new way, which I think has been really advantageous because it's allowed people to see a bunch of bright dots on a map and go, what's this? So it kind of draws attention to the issue. 
Um, it also helps us sort of see geographically what might be going on. The first thing, though, just I want to make clear, all of these numbers, um, you scroll in and you scroll in, you get to each report. These are not verified reports. Even the ones from the UN or NGOs that I think are excellent and doing great work, we've just marked them unverified if they're not things we've verified personally. Um, so right now, as uh, Patricia Sellers was saying yesterday, you know, hopefully this is documentation that can lead to evidence. This is not evidence per se. This is giving us a snapshot of what might be happening, which, as I'm sure you all know, is very hard to document during a uh, live war. Um, just to get a quick idea, though, you can see that 28 in the middle just signifies Syria. That's when we don't have a city or a town or anything. But you can see there are quite a number of incidents um, in Homs, um, down in the south in Dara, uh, Aleppo and Idlib in the north, Latakia. Um, these numbers, however, we have about 230 reports on the map right now, but those encompass women, men, children, um, as young as seven, and they potentially encompass thousands of people. It's not 270 individuals, because many of the reports contain more than one story. Um, sometimes it talks about 20 women who were subject to sexual abuse in prison, et cetera. So when you click around the map, and I encourage you to do so, the URL is womenundersiegesyria.crowdmap.com. You can then sort however you want on the right there by filtering reports. Um, and as you click through, you can see that each of these is clickable and you end up with a particular story. And I'm gonna take you through some of those. Before I do, I just wanted to, to kind of give an overall view. There are three ways that a number of organizations have identified as um, the main ways in which women and men are being sexually violated in Syria. And I would add a fourth, but the three main ways are in detention, which has been the most well-documented and certainly involves um, a fair share of men. Um, and just as an aside, about 20% of the reports on our map are of men so and boys. Um, the second way would be rape at checkpoints or sexualized violence at checkpoints where women are pulled out of cars, um, soldiers rape them, perhaps soldiers enter a car, something like that. Um, the third way is in home raids where, for instance, in Homs, there were you know, a heavy number of home raids, and then what would happen is perhaps there would be a bombing from above, and then Shabiha, the plainclothes militia, would go house to house and rape and loot and kill um, with knives and guns, and I've heard so many horror stories in this sense. And often what would happen is women would say, you know, there are no men home, so the women would be attacked as a means of kind of drawing the men out. The fourth way that I would mention, though, um, that sort of fits into all of, well, fits into detention, but, and I'll tell you some specific stories, but there are a number of stories about girls um, and young women, especially, being held in private houses around Syria or apartments that are sort of being used as small detention cells. And whether these are in any way organized, we have no idea, but we do know, I know of names, I know of, of Shabiha members who have been, you know, fingered. They are pointed out as activating these houses as kind of networks where they're trading girls from house to house. So this is something that I'm currently investigating. Um, it's something I've talked about with people at the UN and other places that we all have heard is going on, but we don't have necessarily solid evidence beyond one or two houses. So. I just wanted to take you through some uh, very specific cases. Um, and. I'll, I'll tell you exactly what we know, how we know it, um, and how solid that information is. So this in particular I chose because this is one of those girls who's been held in one of those private houses. This one is in Idlib. Uh, this is a case the UN documented, but I also personally documented when I was in southern Turkey recently. So I met with the hospital administrator who, um, where the, the girl has been treated. Uh, whether she's there right now or not, he wouldn't tell me, but I kind of had a feeling she was upstairs while we were talking about her. Uh, he wouldn't let me meet with her because he said that she's so traumatized that she really can't retell this story um, very often, but that she's in serious need of psychological help. And, you know, of course, I've tried to connect him with some people. Um, but as a side note, working as a journalist in this area, I've come across survivors' um, families, uh, survivors themselves who won't 
speak with me because other journalists have come through or human rights workers have come through and already re-traumatized these survivors. So there's a real problem of gathering this information, partly because of that, partly because of the great stigma, which we all know about, but I'll talk a little bit about soon. So in this case in particular, this 14-year-old girl has been documented um, being held in the basement of a private house for seven or eight days. Um, she had very clear signs of sexual assault. Um, I understand that she was forced to perform oral sex. She uh, was burned with cigarettes and tortured, uh, denied food and water. Um, and then she was released by a woman who was working in the house serving tea and coffee and was smuggled out, apparently. Um, just, I was going to say to put a face on <laughs> what I just talked about, this is not that girl, but the, and there is no face, obviously, but this is a 16-year-old girl named Zainab, and this is a photo by an Italian photographer named Matilda Gattoni. She took this photograph in Lebanon of this young girl who was forced to flee, she says, because her classmates were being kidnapped, um, killed, dumped um, with signs of sexualized violence on their bodies. So she and her family chose to flee. Um, this is an interesting case of detention. Um, there is a large sports city in, um, I always mispronounce it, I'm sorry, Latakia in the north um, that you can actually find on Google Maps. And I've been told about this by a number of activists and, and was given some very detailed descriptions of what's going on there. Uh, the numbers are quite high of people who are supposedly being held at this sports city that is being run by Shabiha supposedly, um, also should be tied to the Assad family, is the rumor, but these are rumors, and I'm just putting them out there because we need to try to figure out what's real and what isn't. Um, so I use the information, the intelligence in the room to hopefully think about these things. Um, allegedly, about eight or 900 people are being held there, women and men, and sexualized violence um, is rampant in this place. And particularly, I know of a couple of cases, uh, one of a 20-something-year-old woman who was raped and um, tortured there was finally released after negotiations. And I spoke to the activist who did the negotiating for her. And she was uh, left on the side of a highway um, and later committed suicide. And apparently, this is a quite well known case in that area. Um, the activist I spoke to, who's named here, said he knows of two other women currently being held, and they've been there for three or four months already. He talks about how there are ongoing phone calls to the families uh, where they describe what they're doing to the women. It's a kind of psychological torture of the families as well. Um, and on that note, I've also heard about um, a family that received a video of their 12-year-old girl being raped by men in uniform. Um, so there is a real element to kind of uh, the psychological torture of the greater population, which of course rape is so excellent at doing. Um, I always say that rape is not just destroying one woman, it's destroying an entire family, an entire society, society um, communities. It's really tearing apart the fabric of a country, and right now that's Syria. Uh, just one more case I'll take you through right now. Um, this is, I met with an activist who's uh, currently based in Turkey, and she, like many activists, kind of circulate in and out of jail at this point. And when they're in there, they tend to speak with many other women that they're held in cells with who are circulated from detention center to detention center. Um, and in this particular case, she says she was held with a woman, a 33-year-old doctoral student, who had been paraded around naked, uh, been subject to genital torture with electrical shock, um, raped and then impregnated. But the really um, tragic part as well, or I suppose it all is, that she was beaten um, months later until she miscarried. So that kind of leads me to talking a bit about um, some of the consequences, which I'll get to in a minute, of rape. But right now what I wanted to talk about was some of the uh, data that we're able to gather from these reports on the map. So these are charts that are drawn up by our Columbia epidemiologists. And what this shows us, as you can see, we are tracking very carefully, when we can, who the perpetrators are in the hopes that we'll be able to provide some sort of accountability. But we're also tracking um, very specifically what the acts are. Um, so in this case, you can see that the red is, is women, the blue is men. Um, the majority of rape uh, actual physical penetration is happening to women, but um, over 40% of men in these reports are also experiencing rape. Um, 
one of the really interesting categories here to me is the tension for sexualized violence, which Patricia Sellers was speaking about yesterday, this idea of sexual enslavement. I mean, this is slightly different than what she was talking about, but this is when we've seen an expressed intent to kidnap women, or you know, I don't know if we have a case of men, but women uh, for the express purpose of rape and holding them. This is not just when women are held and raped. This is when we, we've gathered some kind of intent expressed, which are very few cases, but it's still, after the experience of Bosnia, I think worth keeping an eye on, you know, how much of this is actually about creating some kind of rape camp. Um, in terms of multiple attackers, in, in colloquial terms, that's gang rape. So nearly 40% of women in these reports um, have experienced gang rape. And uh, I think the numbers about, I have specific numbers if you want later, 12% about of men have experienced gang rape. So this is to speak to the perpetrators. Um, you'll see that the majority of both male and female uh, victims are being attacked by government perpetrators, or shabiha, which are government-aligned perpetrators. There is a vast um, problem right now with getting information. There are different methods in which it's being delivered to the world, and I would argue that the opposition has been better at getting out information. So to that end, we don't have many reports of Free Syrian Army side rape or other kinds of human rights violations. Actually, though, I'm looking at people from Human Rights Watch, and I know that they've documented atrocities quite well um, from the Free Syrian Army side so far. So we know it's happening. We also know in war it happens on all sides. It's an effective tool no matter who's using it, and they know this. Um, in this case, you might be wondering why nearly 90% of the attackers of men our government forces and why it's higher than women. That's because most of the cases on our map have taken place in detention. So these are government detention centers that we receive these reports from. We do have a category of other or unknown. That's when the perpetrator is completely unexpressed. We have no idea who it is. We've also heard you know, reports of foreign fighters coming in, um, and it's kind of hard to figure out which side they're on, although possibly they're on the opposition side, it's just very murky at this point. But the one thing I want to say about the imbalance of government to non-government perpetrators is while there is an issue with what information's getting out, the US Institute of Peace did some interesting work studying who the main perpetrators of rape are in conflict. And in the majority of wars, it is government perpetrators. So I would not be entirely surprised if that turns out to be the case. But of course, this is information we're going to have to work very hard to kind of track down and verify. But what I will also say, at this point, there is enough information that these war crimes are being committed by the government, that these are crimes against humanity. There is enough to investigate. There is enough potentially to prosecute. So with that said, we know this is happening. We don't know the exact numbers. We don't know who all the victims are, but we know it's happening. And to me, it's happening too much. Do I have a few more minutes, I'm guessing? Okay, good. Um, so this I wanted to show you is a woman that I interviewed who is a survivor of rape. She's also a Free Syrian Army fighter. And there are some women, not many, but there are some women fighting for the Free Syrian Army. She's currently paralyzed in a hospital in Jordan. And I spoke to her uh, via Skype because I was back in New York. But she's paralyzed because um, a soldier with a rifle broke her neck finally um, and broke her spine. So she was detained twice, each I think it was for about a month at a time. Uh, she was tortured and held in stress positions and you know, folded up in a tire and beaten um, and raped multiple times. Sorry, I hit something here. Okay. The reason I, I've showed you this picture like this, I just wanted to explain um, and also give you her name. She asked me that I use her name in publication and I published this story on our site and also in the Atlantic um, monthly online, and I knew this would reach a wide audience, and I very much appreciated that she wanted to use her name because there are so few names attached to this issue. Um, but after speaking with her doctors and um, understanding a bit more about the psychological state she's in, um, knowing that she has children still inside Syria, um, I felt that I didn't want to put her name out there fully publicly. Um, it's also about, you know, it was a balance between respecting the rights of someone and what she wants, but she was not insistent. She just said, oh, sure, use my name. So I, I just chose to pull back a little bit. Um, so I called her Alma. That's her first name, and I published um, her, her middle name, but not her, her last name. 
And then she said, you can show a photo of my face. So again, I did the same thing. I spoke to different human rights organizations. It's funny, I, I consulted with journalists and I consulted with human rights people. And the journalist said, we need to show faces, we need to show names, we need to really you know, put this in front of people so they can see who these people are. This is truly what happened in Bosnia and we need to do that now. And then all of the human rights people I spoke to said, well, you might be able to show her face but giving her name while her children are inside Syria, it's a death sentence. So I, I went with the safer side of things. I think we understand well enough that there's a woman who's been tortured and beaten. So, so um, back to some more charts. This is my last one, I promise. But this is the consequences among women of sexualized violence, um, according to the reports on the map. Um, you can see anxiety and depression is quite high, but it, it's also quite low considering you know, what we can and can't document at this point. I'm guessing it's much, much higher than what we can actually say. Uh, to me, the most interesting category on here is death, and that means that these women have been raped and then witness killed. Um, they have been raped and then committed suicide, or they have been found dead with signs of sexualized violence. So, you know, that I believe in our latest statistics, I think it's 17%, it's ranged between 17 and 20%. So we're losing, what, about a fifth of evidence, you know, as we go, and that's just what we know of at this point. So I think that's a, a good indicator that there's a, a tremendous amount of this happening that we can't even ever see. Um, the other thing that's interesting is nearly, I think it's five and a half percent or some six percent of women are experiencing pregnancy, allegedly, and that is because we hear of doctors who are performing abortions. I have been contacted by people trying to help their family member leave Syria to receive an abortion. Um, of course, I have no way of knowing that those cases are particularly perpetrated by rape because of this war, but you sort of, you know, that's what the stories are told. Um, and then you also hear about um, things like this particular story I just wanted to tell you. This was relayed to me by a psychiatrist who works with um, Syrian refugees and particularly survivors of torture and sexualized violence. Um, she visited a family in a home visit and there were two sisters, their brother, um, a wife of the brother and this, the girl's father in the room. There were also three children, age six, seven, and about eight. Then there was also a baby in the room. Um, and the women sat there and wept and explained how their Syrian army soldiers had come into their house in Homs, tied up the father and brother, raped the three women in front of them. You know, she said the whole time the men wouldn't look up, they wouldn't talk to her. You know, the women just cried and, and explained what had happened. Um, they were burning them with cigarettes on their legs and vaginas. Um, and they allegedly told the women, you want your freedom, this is your freedom, which is a phrase I've actually heard in some other cases. Um, the psychiatrist looked at the baby and sort of did the math in her head and said, you know, is this baby from the rape? And she said the entire room fell silent, everyone looked away, nobody would say anything. I don't have an answer, but, you know, according to the psychiatrist, yes, she thinks that this was potentially a baby from rape. You know, it's, it will happen, I suppose. If I have a few minutes, I wanted to, um, five minutes, perfect, um, quickly pull back and talk about other kinds of violence that women are experiencing in this war, because it's, rape is a factor, but as I keep saying, torture is a factor, um, and then once women are refugees, there are a tremendous, number of other things happening to them. So this was um, this is just a shot I took at, at Zatari in Jordan, which now has about 150,000 refugees. Um, within an hour of getting there, I met this young woman who um, was you know, showing off her beautiful baby, but also told me that her husband spends most nights out with other women and that he comes home every two or three nights to beat her. Um, and I soon learned that this was very common at the camp. Domestic violence is a very real and widespread issue. I think the frustration levels are extraordinarily high. Men can't get work. Uh, women have nothing to do all day. Men have nothing to do all day. It's just you know a hotbed of, of potential domestic violence. And I actually spoke to a UN worker who said that it was as bad as anything she'd ever seen in IDP camps in Congo or uh, Somaliland or wherever. Um, this is kind of a neat photo because this is I was there with a photographer. Um, 
And I spent the day at the wedding of a 15-year-old girl, a Syrian girl. Um, and before everyone gets entirely outraged, she was marrying an 18-year-old boy. So it wasn't you know, one of these cases of a 60-year-old Saudi man coming. But I certainly met girls who were involved in things like that. Um, but in this case, the photographer right now is taking a picture of the marriage contract that was written um, in front of us um, on my reporter's notebook, which was sort of jarring, but... <laughs> um, and basically, it's, it's a bill of sale, you know, that here's what I'm selling my daughter for. Um, you can see that's the bride, obviously, and the groom is the young man with the slightly sticking out ears. Um, and the man in blue with the hat is her father, who was only 32. Um, and he, I asked him, I said, did you want your daughter to marry now at this age? And he said, no, if I had a choice, if I could support my family, you know, if I could um, feed, he showed me his um, less than six month old baby whose ribs were showing, he said, if I could feed my baby, no, I would rather she didn't marry now. Um, but it's not uncommon for women to marry young in certain parts of Syria, and she's from Dara, where I think this is a more common practice to marry younger, but it does show that potentially this wouldn't be happening if they weren't stuck in a refugee camp with no other resources. Um, quickly, this is to uh, southern Turkey at the border. I met 13 and 14 year old girls. Um, this is one 14 year old girl who's showing me cuts on her hand because she's working 12 hours a day picking cotton um, and other kinds of, I think she said lentils. Um, and they're working on local Turkish farms because they have to. So child labor is certainly an issue. Um, and this, um, there were 70, 80 people living in this um, broken down kind of, it's not even a house. I mean, it was crumbling, the structure. Um, and this baby had been born two days before I got there with no medical assistance, anything like that. And the women uh, complain and complain of uh, birth-related back pain, which, you know, it, it sounds like nothing, but I'm sure if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you have no medicine or anything, it's, it's something. Um, this is in near Kilis. Uh, there is a public park. I, I've been told recently that this may not exist anymore, but when I was there, there were 4,000 Syrians squatting in the scorching sun, and they had crossed the border because they thought there would be a second UN camp, um, but there isn't one there. So they were just living in these horrible conditions, and you know, the woman tried to hand me that child who has scabies all over its legs, you can see. And they actually said to me, you want to see violence against women? Go see our bathrooms. <laughs> um, and just to end, um, I'm really glad that there's going to be this session on Syria this afternoon focusing on trauma because if, I mean, this is a slight smile on this girl's face, but I, I mean, she really typified for me what you're seeing on the faces of women and girls and, and boys. You know, just this intense um, depression and trauma. Um, so I just thought I would leave you on the most miserable note I possibly could. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation about so many very depressing and uh, really sad stories. And we, uh, we know that whatever you're covering, it's only really the tip of uh, the iceberg. So, yeah each single story I find really heavy to bear already when hearing it. And therefore, I very much appreciate what kind of work you and other organizations working in this important field are doing. I'm sure that there are many questions among the audience, so please raise your hand. Um, if you are still thinking about your question, I would have one that I would like to ask you, because you said that uh, the government like in most other cases, also might be responsible of most of the sexual violence. And a few months ago, we saw a campaign by the Syrian government claiming that rebels were having females coming from outside doing a kind of sex jihad to be sexual slaves of the rebels. We saw people like women presented on governmental TV who confessed allegedly that they had uh, this kind of uh, relationship while they were in rebel camps, but it turned out later when it was investigated that one of them was a girl that the Syrian authorities had kidnapped on her way to school. Another one was a Tunisian nurse, but of course this is another form, like uh, a way of the government not to deal with what is happening really, but to make it even worse. Could you maybe comment on whether you see any impact of that? 
Sure, and that, that sex jihad thing continues across the internet and media outlets. I keep seeing news stories as if it hasn't been debunked, but it has. And I would refer you to a really great article by a journalist named Shira Frankel, who, who really debunked this very well. Um, but what you're talking about is propaganda, and I think it's widespread in the conflict on both sides, um, which causes documenting something like these human rights violations to be incredibly difficult. Um, there are reports on our map that we've gotten from SANA, the state news agency, where they have a man come on TV and he's been beaten and he confesses to say, I've raped women, I've carried out these murders. I mean, is this a confession? I don't know. Um, but at the same time, on the other side, you see YouTube videos made by um, rebel soldiers where there's a man sitting there holding his former Syrian army ID and he looks exhausted and who knows what's happening to him, and he's confessing to having raped and tortured, and you know who knows if there's a man with a gun off to the side of the video. Y these videos are nearly impossible to confirm in a lot of instances, but it is such a major factor in this war. Anybody in the audience? Please, uh, here are the, yeah. There were two questions. Maybe we can take them both in a row, since would we have very limited time. I would like to collect yeah. a few questions. I'll do it very short. I would like to know about a YouTube which I've seen. Uh, in Turkey, it was very much, um, there were two, three videos which shocked me quite a lot, but one of them was with a naked woman which were taken from the rebels and then um, really cut off and we could see it within the YouTube and then uh, within the Facebook, we decided to say, stop it, don't distribute it anymore because this is what they want. And a question, the video, was this, you're talking about those women marching into a truck or when you say cut off, I don't know. No, no really, no, really, they, uh, she was naked. The man hold her and it was a uh, um, punishment and uh, then she was cut off with a knife and we could see all the, and later it was um, shortened and shortened at the end, it was left. But it was a shocking scene and this kind of scenes we could see quite a lot and after Gezi Park in Turkey, uh, we are quite, um, yeah. And I couldn't believe it and I thought this must be a, a I would like to know what you, know about all these stuffs. Uh, there were two people right behind you. <laughs> yeah, Maybe. Please. Um, hello, um, my name is Daniel Crampton. I'm legal advisor with the Berlin Center for Torture Victims. Um, in terms of data verification, uh, do you work with people like uh, HR DAG, Human Rights Data Analysis Group, like Human Rights uh, Data Analysis Group um, <laughs> in Palo Alto? Um, because they also do um, mapping in Syria for the UN actually of deaths, but they're people who are um, also working on especially sexualized violence. Um, and also in terms of uh, post-conflict and transitional justice, your data, if it can be verified, could be used for um, improved multiple, multiple systems estimation, things like that. Do you do that kind of thing and do you have those uh, contacts and that cooperation? They were the, this lady in the, in the row before. Jasmina Berbic von Anwälte ohne Grenzen. Also, ich bedanke mich sehr für Ihre eindrucksvolle Darstellung, insbesondere für Ihre Entscheidung, das Bild und den Namen der Frau nicht zu veröffentlichen. Warum sage ich mal so? Weil es meine Meinung nach als Juristin heutzutage nicht mehr wichtig ist. Ich komme jetzt zurück auf zwei Sachen, die Sie am Anfang erwähnt haben, beziehungsweise dass diese Vergewaltigungen die Gesellschaft zerstören. Das ist mehr als Schicksal oder Folge für eine Frau. Ich würde dazu sagen, nicht die Gesellschaft des Staates, wo das stattfindet, sondern überhaupt weltweit. Das sage ich mal aus dem Grunde, dass ich seit 20 Jahren als Bosnierin diese ganze Geschichte und das Thema Vergewaltigung verfolge, seit massenhaften Vergewaltigung in Bosnien und Herzegowina. Sie haben am Anfang auch gesagt, dass äh, 
heutzutage diese Vergewaltigungen bzw. als Ihre Organisation gegründet worden ist, haben Sie gesagt, hätten wir für Vergewaltigungen in Bosnien und Herzegowina damals gewusst, wären später Vergewaltigungen nicht entstanden. Ich sage das Gegenteil jetzt. Wir wissen, wir haben gewusst, wir wissen heute und dann werden wir morgen wissen, was geschieht. Solche Veranstaltungen finden sehr oft statt. Wir hören immer wieder die gleichen Sachen. Vergewaltigungen finden statt. Wir wissen und die viele Frauen sind bereit auszusagen. Bosnierinnen haben ausgesagt, ich habe heute mich zu Wort gemeldet und gesagt, dass hunderte von, von bosnischen Frauen bereit gewesen sind. Warum? Die Kinder sind da gewesen, deswegen hatten sie keine Möglichkeit zu schweigen. Jetzt, wenn ein, ein, eine Auseinandersetzung, die wir entweder als kriegerische Auseinandersetzung oder als Krieg nennen, kommen immer wieder die gleichen Taten. Frauen werden vergewaltigt. Das ist Strategie der Kriegsführung geworden. Was machen wir? Wir, wir machen an diesen Veranstaltungen gezielte, teilweise Geschichte, aber wir sollen was anderes machen. Wirklich etwas dazu gegen diesen Einsatz gegen Frauen vornehmen, dass es wirklich nicht in der Zukunft stattfindet, weil es eine, eine, eine Strategie geworden ist, die ein Ende zu setzen ist. Danke. Dankeschön. Äh, Entschuldigung, wir haben hier noch zwei Meldungen. شكرا أنا اسمي لما حذاني من فلسطين رام الله بدي أرجع لموضوع جهاد النكاح في عنا مؤسسات مرأة وحقوق إنسان تونسية ثبتت هذه الواقعة لأن النساء التونسيات عدنا من سوريا إلى تونس وهن حوامل أيضا وكانت الحملة واضحة في الصحف التونسية وفي الجوامع التونسية لدفع النساء من تونس للذهاب إلى سوريا لجهاد النكاح هل عندكم اتصال مع هذه المؤسسات أول شيء لأنه هم أيضا وثقوا هذه الحالات الشغلة الثانية في هذا الموضوع بالذات أيضا هناك أظن مسؤولية دولية كبيرة لأنه هؤلاء النساء ذهبنا من الحدود الرسمية من تركيا يعني تنتقلوا من تونس عن طريق ما إلى تركيا ودخلوا من تركيا وتركيا تساند المعاوضة السورية الأقل رسميا وفاتح الحدود لهم فوين المسؤولية هون كيف ممكن نشتغل على هذا الموضوع المسؤولية المجتمع الدولي بالسماح لهؤلاء النساء للدخول للسورية طبعا أنا بحكي عن جهاد النكاح مش معناته ما أنا متفقة مع كل شيء حكيتيه بالعكس وممارسة النظام السوري أصلا للسكشوال فايلنس داخل السجون من عشرات السنين وموثقة أيضا بمؤسسات حقوق الإنسان السورية والدولية ولم يلتفت لها أحد قبل ذلك بس سؤالي خاص بموضوع الجهاد النكاح بس شكرا مساء الخير رنا أمين من سوريا أنا بشتغل أخصائية اجتماعية مع النساء ضحايا العنف من خمس سنوات وحديثا من بداية الثورة السورية من سنتين مع النساء ضحايا العنف وضحايا العنف الجنسي اللي كنت بدي أقوله أنه أول شيء مشكورة جهودك لأنه كتير عم نعاني من صعوبة بالتوثيق وهي مسألة منا, منا سهلة أبدا بعرف أنه الحجم الحقيقي كتير أكتر من, من الأعداد اللي طلعت هون بعرف أنه لنا أصدقاء كتير صديقات تعرضوا للاعتقال وتم إذاء جنسيا سواء اغتصاب أو تحرر جنسي الأعداد كتير كبيرة برجع بأكد لأنه في, في أشخاص مو بس بالمجتمعات أو الناس البسطاء اللي موجودين بالمخيمات أو بالهي ناشطات يعمل كل يوم بتعرضوا للتحرش الجنسي بالمعتقلات أو في حال هي في كتير حالات عم نتابعها بالتجمعات النازحات اللي موجودة في المناطق اللي لا تزال تحت سيطرة النظام نشأ شكل جديد من العنف الجنسي اللي عم يتعرضوا له النساء هو الجنس مقابل, مقابل لقمة العيش اللي عم بيصير هاي الحالات كتير كل يوم عم بتصير 
هي حتى الان بعيده عن التوثيق لانه المناطق بسبب المشاكل الخاصه بالتوثيق اللي عم بيصير انه النساء عم يقدموا خدمات جنسيه مقابل سله غذائيه او مقابل امتياز مثل ثياب للشتويه او اشياء كثير بسيطه منها هي وهي شكل من اشكال ال الاعتداء الجنسي اللي لازم يتسلط عليه الدول لانه هو بالنهايه الجنس المشروط. اللي بيهمني احكي عم بشتغل لساتني وموجوده على الارض دائما نعاني من اجراءات الحمايه، يعني دائما بنشوف صحفيين بيجوا يوثقوا سواء بالمناطق فينا نقول المحرره او خارج سيطره النظام وبيحملوا حالهم وبيمشي ما في اي اجراء حمايه بيحمي المراه اللي اللي عم اللي عم موثق اسمها او عم موثق هي. في شيء ثاني كمان اللي هو المتابعه انه هي الحاله Excuse me could you make it really short because uh, we will need time to answer questions and there is also the forum in the afternoon specifically for Syria okay. so could you just make okay. it really short okay okay بس السؤال الاخير تمام شيء ثاني نسيت السؤال خلص كنت كنت عم بحكي على اجراءات الحمايه والمتابعه تمام المتابعه انه نحن هل هدول النساء عم يتعرضوا عم 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 يتم متابعتهم أم توثيقهم فقط النساء اللي انت شفتيهم حضرتك هل يتم متابعتهم نفسيا طبيا ام هي بس قصه توثيق وكفى بالنسبه لمنظمتكم شكرا اوكي اي ثينك ذات وي نيد تو كم تو ذا انسرز بات اس اي منشن بيفور افتروردز ذير ويل تايم تو توك تو لورين اند ذير از تايم ان ذا فورمز اس ويل تو ديسكاس اول ايشوز I'll try to start at the beginning. Um, uh, the, about the video, um, the one thing I wanted to say about that was when I was at that wedding I showed, um, there was, I spent a lot of time with some of the men that you saw in that photo, and um, they pulled out their cell phones and wanted to show me videos. And I, I try to avoid watching these videos because I can't sleep at night as it is. Um, But you know, one of them handed me, and I couldn't look away in this tent, they're handing me them. And, and it was a video of um, just one of them that struck me was um, a dead body with a man in a uniform stabbing and stabbing. I thought he was punching the guy, but he was stabbing and stabbing and stabbing 40 times. And all I can think to myself is if that's what they're doing and filming, what are they not <laughs> filming? I mean, what is really, like the brutality levels, it, it's off the charts. I don't know what else to say about it. Um, The, uh, sorry, I think the next name, oh, the Berlin Center for Torture, right. Um, I am in contact with people. I work closely with an organization called Syria Tracker that's tracking deaths. Um, I've spoken with people at Benetech about how we gather this information. You said Palo Alto, I figured that's what you meant. In terms of verifying the information, um, we do have a team at Columbia that is right now working in the field, trying to take all this data, and, and they've got a random sample grab. And they're trying to assess how good the information is. So hopefully we'll have that answer soon. It's going a lot more slowly than we thought it would due to the nature of, you know, people disappearing, basically. You know, we've got a lead out and then that person drops off the map. So it's been a very slow process. Um, but yes, I am working with people who do data analysis and it's fascinating and very interesting stuff. Um, The sex jihad, I, I mean, as I said, I believe it's been entirely debunked at this point, and certainly there may be cases of women traveling to provide sex, whether it's to rebels or government forces, but I actually feel that that's a minor thing in this entire situation. These are not the people that I'm personally worried about. Um, I, I don't know really what else to say about that, but, um, and I agree with you that the international community should be pouring aid like a flood into Syria, into the, the zone around Syria, and that there is not enough refugee help going on. And there is no psychological help. I met the one psychologist in southern Turkey trying to handle thousands of people in a refugee camp. I mean, it's an absurd situation. I work to connect people and someone asked, you know, whether I, I don't provide aid. I'm a journalist. I document these stories. But certainly when someone says to me, can you provide psychological help? I say, I call the psychologist I know and I say, can you connect? Or I call, you know, someone behind the scenes at an NGO and say, do you do this? So I kind of work as a connector as best I can. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the next question. Um, actually, it was about Bosnia, and I, I entirely agree with you that we know now much more than we ever did. And, and what I was talking about when Gloria Steinem said that, it was her realization was if we had known this happened in the Holocaust, could we have then done something by Bosnia? But I get your point. Now we know it happened in Bosnia, and here we are going, well, it's happening again in Syria. I hold on to hope 
that this is not the way humanity wants to live. <laughs> and I hold on to hope that, that men care very much about what happens to their families and to themselves and to their sisters and their mothers. And I, I believe that there's empathy and I believe that this is not a female problem, this is a human rights problem. And I think any uh, human being worth their salt understands that. Um, I also think this is not a natural part of war. You can look back in history and find a number of conflicts in which this was not a condition of war. Um, I think there are particular cases, and I'm gonna get this wrong, um, but if you look on our website, there's a piece called um, No, It's Not Natural, something like that, uh, Rape in War. And I think it was El Salvador where a particular rebel army was trained not to. You know, they were told by their commanders, don't do that. And I think it's entirely possible that this can become a greater kind of line in war to pull back from where we've gone. Um, and also, as Patricia Sellers was saying yesterday, you know, this is not something, I, I mean, right. And also, you know, maybe war, I, I mean, I'm shocked by the brutality of Syria. I feel like we've gone so far to one end, hopefully, that this is not something will stay at this extreme. Uh, was there another thing, or was that? Oh, just uh, the other thing was sort of about, you were, I think you were mostly talking about the idea of survival sex. And there are, I know Human Rights Watch just put out um, a story about women who are being forced to trade sex maybe to have apartments in Lebanon. I think that was what their story was. And that was actually something I witnessed um, months ago when I was in Lebanon. I heard these cases. I've also heard rumors that NGOs are trading um, food vouchers for sex, you know, and I, I've talked about this with people who work in these organizations, nobody will name them, so, you know, again, it's just a rumor, but we know that in all refugee situations, these things just happen. You know, women become the vulnerable population more so than they were. Well, and maybe also in the neighboring countries, they become particularly vulnerable because they don't have a legal status there. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of things, like you showed in one picture, this marriage contract, but if you don't have a legal status as such, you can't and really... And it's illegal in Jordan. So um, technically, they were all committing a crime, yeah. which actually I was told by UN authorities that that really comes into play if that couple has a child, because then that child does not have citizenship, um, and there, there's kind of a multi-generational problem starting here. Not to mention multi-generational trauma, which is what we're, we'll be talking about, I guess. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of the session. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It was very interesting. I have uh, two more announcements for you. I mean, now we're off for lunch break, and in the afternoon, you've seen in the program, we will have different forums. You will find signposts out there which forum is taking place where. I think the Syria forum is taking place here, and the other two, you will definitely find signs out there. So please uh, uh, find your way into the very interesting forums that afternoon. And then there is a coffee break that in the program is a bit longer. Uh, the reason for that is that we thought, uh, since we have this gorgeous exhibition here at the moment, we also offer uh, a guided tour through the exhibition. So in the coffee break, you will find different uh, guided tours, and one of them is exclusively for men, so also they can see it in a kind of protected group. So please make uh, use of this chance as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>